I'd like to welcome each and every one out this morning. I'm glad everybody got up and come on in. Continue to remember our church family. I talked to some this week. Said they're going to be back. So uh, hopefully they will. Hopefully they feel like it and come on back in and be with us. Uh, we got Brother Sam, as you know, this morning with us. Uh, called him a, our Brother Jim. Did. Brother Jim won't let me call him. I don't know what the deal is. Every, every time we start doing the monthly, and I get to him, I'll take care of that one for you. So I don't know if he gives him. Well, yeah. Then. Yeah, Brother Jim's going to give him advice. But anyway, uh, Brother Jim called him. He called me right back and said, yeah, he'd be, he was free. He could be here this morning. Thank God for that, for filling the spot for us and answering the call. So let's make him welcome. Brother Sam. Good to be here in person. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Um, today I was going to talk about worry, and it, it reminded me of a story. Uh, there's a man who is out camping in the woods. He's an unbeliever, you know. Uh, he, he comes from a Christian family, but he himself has fallen away. He just doesn't believe anymore. So he decides one Sunday morning, instead of going to church, he's going to go out camping. So he does. He goes off into the woods, out into the hills and mountains and he's having himself a grand old time when out of the corner of his eye he sees a bear coming around the bend of a path and so he takes off running and that bear starts chasing him and so he's freaking out and he's thinking good lord I should have just gone to church you know he has kind of a come to Jesus moment for the first time in months he falls on his knees and prays lord please help me don't let this bear let this be a Christian bear and so the bear gets up to him, bows its head, and says, Lord, thank you for this food. <laughs> Wasn't exactly what he was expecting. But uh, this is quite a worrisome time to be alive. Quite a worrisome time to be alive. Eh? It, it seems every time we turn around, there's uh, some new danger, whether it be this virus that we had or a... Uh, being forced to stay in our homes or in some places uh, not necessarily here in the U.S. but in other places people even being arrested for setting foot in the house of worship it, sometimes it can seem as though the world is just kind of falling down around our ears doesn't it? And, and we just kind of have to feel like we have to ask ourselves where is God right now? When the cares of this world rise up to crush us, we kind of just ask ourselves, where is God right now? Where, where is the loving hand of God to reach down and help us with this? My friend, sometimes it can feel like that. But can I tell you something? There is nothing new under the sun. Every generation of believers, from us here in this church today, all the way back to the apostles of Christ in the earliest years of the church, have faced the same issues, the same concerns, and many of them probably ask themselves the very same questions. We can find our answer in the same way that they found theirs. Now, if you'll turn with me in your Bible to the book of Judges, chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. 1 through 13, excuse me. Then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of Midian for seven years. And the head of Midian prevailed against Israel. 
Because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made for themselves the dens, the caves, and the strongholds, which are in the mountains. So it was, whenever Israel had sown, the Midianites would come up. Also Amalekites and people of the east would come up against them. Then they would encamp against them and destroy the produce of the earth as far as Gaza, and leave no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor donkey. For they would come up with their livestock and their tents, coming in as numerous as locusts. Both they and their camels were without number, and they would enter the land and destroy it. So Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried out to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet to the children of Israel, who said to them, so, Thus says the Lord your God, I brought you out of, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hands of the Egyptians, and out of the hands of all who oppressed you, and drove them out before you, and gave you their land. Also I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the terebinth tree, which was in Ophrah, which belonged to Joash and Abazarite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the winepress and were to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon says to him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord is with us, why then has all this happened to us? And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. If you'll be pray with me. Lord, I thank you for allowing us to be here today, Lord. I thank you for allowing us to be here in spite of this sickness, Lord. I ask, Lord, that you will guide us, you will direct us, Lord, and you will just form a hedge of protection around us, Lord. And that during the sermon today, we will put away all distractions. And no one will leave without hearing what you need them to hear. Amen. Now, Gideon is a pretty obscure person in the Bible. In fact, I can personally only remember a single sermon that I ever heard uh, that preached about the man. And yet, despite this, Gideon has been called by many not just a great judge over Israel, but the greatest judge to ever rule over Israel. But what is a judge exactly? Now, we know of the great and not-so-great rulers of Israel. We hear that their names repeated often. And the, the histories of their lives are some of the most prominently referenced in the entire Bible. Saul, David, Solomon, just to name a few. But when we think about the rulership of Israel, we think about kings. We think about a monarchy, but it was not always that way. You see, before there ever was a king in Israel, the people of Israel were ruled by God himself. They had no laws, but the laws that were given to them by the Lord. They had no kings, no magistrates, no politicians. Thank the Lord. We should all be so lucky. God would speak directly to his people and hand them his laws through a prophet that he would raise up. Now, this form of government where the people are ruled by God is called a theocracy. So when the people of Israel would sin and God would inevitably punish them, there was no king in, uh, with a crown of gold on his head, surrounded by trained soldiers and glimmering armor to come save him. So when God chose to spare his people from the punishment that they had earned, God would select a prophet, imbue them with his authority, and send them out to do his will. And these prophets were called the judges. During the day of Gideon, such a time had come again. You see, during this time, uh, these people, the Midianites, existed. They were a savage and wild people. Uh, they were what's called nomads. They didn't have any one set land that was set aside for themselves. Instead, they would travel far and wide, uh, raiding and pillaging and taking what they needed to live for through another year from those around them. So they were not well liked. Things that came natural to the settled people of Canaan, such as the Israelites, was simply beyond their grasp because of their livestock. They were feared by all, but none so much as the Israelites. You see, shortly before invading the land, a Midianite priest 
had come into the land of the Israelites and converted many of them to idolatry, worshiping idols, false gods that were every bit as wild and uncivilized as they were. But by far the worst form of idolatry that they had brought into the people, to the people of Israel, and that they had learned from the Midianites, was the sin of self-worship. They have a lot more self-confidence than I did. <laughs> the Bible says the people of Israel would worship their own reflections when they went to get water. If there is one thing that would make God even more angry than worshiping a dead hunk of rock, which is what these idols were, it's worshiping one's own self as though they were God. So a holy God looking down from heaven and seeing the fouled idolatry of his people that he loves and that he has chosen for his own allows them to be conquered, conquered by the Midianites. And the Midianites entered into Israel, into the land of God that he had promised to his people and, and began taking everything that wasn't nailed down. So much so that the people had to flee and live in caves. Imagine that for a moment. Everything that the people of Israel have that they've been working so hard for just so that they can survive another year is just taken from them. Food taken off their families' plates. Not only this, but the Midianites would take their valuables as well. Then they cry out to the Lord in lamentation and in repentance, and God hears them. And as he has done at this point five times prior, you'd think they'd get the lesson by now. God begins to search for a man to anoint as his prophet, as judge over all of Israel. And he finds him in a man called Gideon. Now Gideon likely wouldn't have been my first choice if I were choosing somebody to save our country. And probably would not have been yours. You see, Gideon was a small man, and the Bible says a meek man. When God finds him, he's in the wine press threshing wheat. He's doing this here because he does not have the courage to do so on the hilltop where it's normally done. Uh, you see, normally uh, the wheat is planted or was planted at this point in time and threshed on a hill so that when they thresh the wheat, the chaff would be blown away by the wind. But down in the wine press, it just comes back down and gets in his clothes and in his eyes and in his hair. So there he is, a small man hiding, covered in wheat chaff, likely sweating profusely. And then the Bible says the angel of the Lord appears to him and says, The Lord is with you, O mighty man of valor. I think Gideon was probably the only person in the Bible who ever thought that God was making fun of him. But imagine for a moment that you were in this situation. Your home country has become sickened with moral corruption. And this has brought judgment and wrath upon your nation. And instead of bravely standing up and proclaiming the word of God, you're sitting in the shadows trying your best just not to be noticed. And then God sends an angel to you and says, you're going to be the one to fix this. You're going to be the one who I use to make this country mine again. But you know what? God used Gideon to defeat the Midianites. God had Gideon raise a host of men to fight the Midianites. A group that the Bible says was without number. They were so numerous that they were beyond counting. They were like locusts. And Gideon, one thing led to another, ended up having to fight the Midianites with only 300 men. And he didn't even have to actually fight the men. God took care of it. Ladies and gentlemen, is that not a mirror to our world today? I just want to take a step back for a minute. There may be no invaders or pillagers in our homes taking our food and va valuables, yet the morality of America today is no better than the fallen sinful behavior of the Israelites back then. The very sin that God punished Israel for, the self-worship, is the preferred religion in the world today. You can see it when you turn on the television. You can read it when you open a textbook. You can hear it when you listen to the radio. People talking about, oh, oh, well, this is my truth. As though truth can even exist without God. Living your best life now. Just doing what makes you happy. If it feels good, do it. This fallen sinful world that we live in today revolves <laughs> around the self, not around God. Our world has even gotten 
so low as to invent its own incorrect version of history and creation simply so that they can attempt to edit God out of his own creation. But Gideon shows us that we can fight back against that immorality of this world. That all it takes is a small group of people acting in God's will to change the world around them. And sometimes it can feel like a near impossible task. I mean, if you are unfortunate enough to own a phone that you can connect to the internet with, it is just a deluge of immorality and evil. And it can just feel so disheartening. And it can make you fear for yourself, fear for your children, fear for your grandchildren, and what kind of world they're going to have to grow up in. But if God can use 300 men, one of whom was small and meek, and can use it to change the world and bring an entire nation back to him, what could he do with a church as small as it is here in America? Amen. If we utterly sold out to him, it is never too late. Next, I want to talk about the care of persecution. If you look with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. Second Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 12. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Incontinent means without self-control. Fierce, despisers of all that is good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away into with divers' lusts. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as, their, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose of faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came upon me in Antioch and in Iconium. I still don't know how to pronounce that. At Lystra, with persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Now why would I even bring that up? Y'all don't want to hear this. This is not what y'all came here to hear. But ladies and gentlemen, we need to hear it. It's a truth that we can't run from. I want you to take another look at verse 11. Now, as you probably know, this is Paul speaking here. That the former great persecutor of Christianity who was then converted to become its most powerful prophet. Something that may not be more commonly known is that Paul is currently rotting in a prison cell awaiting his execution. You see, Paul had once been among the most well-respected of the Jewish people alive in that day as he himself reveals, when he is taken before the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin which were the ruling body of the Jews at this point in time. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees, a teacher of teachers. When other members of his order had theological questions, they would come to him for answers. He was of the tribe of Benjamin, Benjamin the beloved, the favorite son of Jacob. Paul was a Hebrew among Hebrews. You see, in that day and age uh, that Paul lived, most of the people living in Judea, despite being Jews, did not actually speak Hebrew. Not anymore. And no, they would have spoken Greek 
in order to better communicate with the nations and people around them. Regretfully, their own language had become something of a dead language to them. So for one to be able to speak it fluently was a big deal. It was a sign of piety and intelligence and education. I say all of this to say that Paul was a big deal back in his day. He was not just some random Pharisee who you would have met on the road. He was the Billy Graham of Pharisees. He was well-respected and well-loved. And yet not even Paul, with all of his social standing, could escape persecution that followed him throughout his journeys. You see, in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, these were all places in the Galatian country where Paul had gone on his first, second, and third missionary journeys. When Paul arrived at the city of Antioch, along with his friend and helper Barnabas, he made a living by making tents. Slowly, he began to use his trade to reach out to people and spread the good news of Christ. But unfortunately, the priests and the zealots of that city soon heard about what Paul and Barnabas were saying and what they were talking about. And they soon put a stop to that. Paul, though he was the most thoroughly educated and highly intelligent Jew of his day, is driven out of Antioch like a common criminal. All for the crime of being a Christian, but it doesn't end there. Rejected by his own people, Paul doesn't even seem to be phased. He just dusts himself off and then continues on his way to a city called Lystra, where Paul begins again, determined to win a chance with these people who are not even Jews, so that he can convert them to Christ. He opens up his ministry there by healing a crippled man. Unfortunately, this does not have the effect that Paul and Barnabas had hoped it would have. Uh, you see, instead of asking about Christ, who, in whose name Paul had healed this man, the people of Lystra began to worship Paul and Barnabas as though they were gods. And as Paul and Barnabas are trying to put a stop to these rumors, here at the most inopportune time, those people of Antioch, those zealots, uh, unsatisfied with merely driving Paul out of their city, have come to Lystra to kill him. And they see Paul, and they see people worshiping Paul. And so they think, well, okay, we got him now. So the people of Antioch grab Paul. And they drag him outside of the city and they grab stones and they stone him to the point of death. There are some theologians who believe that he in fact did die. And that in order for him to continue uh, his ministry, God had to raise him again from the dead. I'm sure you can probably tell where this application is going. If Paul a man who was so beloved before his conversion and so important historically could not escape persecution, how will we? Well, the answer is we won't. So there's an increasing group of Christians that I am a little upset with. A little upset. It's a group of Christians who just kind of given up on bringing the scripture to this world. They've just given up on reaching out to people. They no longer care about fighting the immorality of this world. They're now just concerned with staying back over here and saying, okay, fine, we can just, we'll stay in our lane. We will just let us worship in peace. But let me tell you something. That's not going to happen. Just as this these people of Antioch attacked Paul and Barnabas, we are going to be attacked. I wish that I could sit here and tell you that everything is going to be fine. That this country, America, where we've always been able to worship as we wish, is going to reverse course and that we are going to go back to being able to uh, just worship freely. That we are going to be able to worship without any restrictions. But that's not the way the Bible says it's going to come down. Eventually, things are going to get worse. A day is going to come when it is going to cost us to follow Christ. A day is going to come when it will cost us socially, when it may even cost us our freedom. In fact, that day may actually have already dawned. Here, in places as close as Canada, 
And as far away as Australia, people are already being imprisoned for going to church, for defying lockdowns. People, now I want to make this clear, who are not like this church, who decided for the sake of safety to remain at home, but people who weighed the risks and decided as a group that they would rather be here in their house of worship with each other and are being punished for it. But I do have good news. You see, the people of Antioch slew Paul. <coughs> Many believe that they killed him, but God raised him back to life. And let me ask you a question. Where is Paul today? And where are the people of Antioch? One of these days, there's going to come persecution, but can I spoil the ending? God wins in the end. Amen. One day, there's going to come persecution, yes, but one day we are going to be sitting in heaven with Paul and Moses and Elijah and Jesus. One day there's going to come a time on this earth where there will be no more persecution. So it, I just thought that I would share that. Now I want to talk about the care of the person. Maybe you're here today and you're not really worried about the sin sick status of this world. It doesn't get to you. You know that that fight will be won eventually. Or maybe you're not as worried about the upcoming persecution of the church uh, as I am. Because it's happened in the past and God will eventually bring us through it. We know that we win. But maybe you are struggling with something that's more of a personal issue. Maybe you're suffering from something that is much more personal of an issue. Such as disease or injury. And I want to talk about another man who had a similar problem. If you'll turn with me in your Bible to chapter John, to the book of John, the gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. I tripped over my tongue there, please forgive me. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but, this, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. I must work, with, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with his saliva. And he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sent. So he went and washed and came back seeing. Now something interesting to note in this is that the Bible doesn't go into a great deal of detail about who this man is that Jesus heals. In fact, it doesn't even tell us this man, his name. But it does tell us that he's been blind since birth. Now, the world that this man lived in was very different from the world we lived in today. You see, in the world today, the disabled can live a very happy and healthy life. But that was not the case for a man in his shoes that day. This man would have been subject to ridicule from the day he was born. You heard it out of the mouths of the prophet themselves, of the uh, apostles themselves. What did this man or his parents do that he was born blind? You see, back in that day, sickness was not just seen as a natural result of the fallen sinful world that we live in. It was considered in every case to be a punishment for sin. Yeah. So you can imagine what it must have been like for his parents when he was born blind. You can imagine the whispers that went on. Did you hear about old so-and-so in the corner? Their son was born blind. Wonder what they've been doing. I always knew they were no good. Mm -hmm. They were no count. And you can wonder how this would have affected this man's relationship with his parents. Because when we see this man, he is begging outside of the temple. You see, outside the temple in Jerusalem, when the poor or the disabled or the sick 
had to beg for food or for alms, they would do it at the gates of the temple where everyone could see them. And yet that man's parents, which we know to be alive, are nowhere to be found. This would have been a very hard life for this man. Every day he would have woken up and he would have had to find his way blindly in the dark to this temple, holding on to the walls as he finally made it there, and then sit and beg for passers-by to have pity on him, living off of other people's goodwill, living off of other people's pity. It would have been a horrible life, a life that no person should have to live. Then comes Jesus. Then comes Jesus. And for some background on how Jesus just left the temple, this is just after Jesus has said to the Pharisees, to their faces, before Abraham was, I am. And then they picked up stones to stone him. So he, Jesus, is fleeing the temple. He and his apostles. And yet he takes time for this man. He is in haste. Yet God still has time for this man. And he still has time for us. Regardless of our personal issues. <clears throat> Sometimes it can seem that, you know, because of all the troubles in this world, because of how obviously set against God it is, that God doesn't have time for us. But can I tell you, that is not true. God is a wonderful multitasker. Amen. That's right. Maybe you're here today, and you're like that blind man who had a personal issue in your life that is just eating away at you. Maybe it's a sickness. Maybe it's the sickness of a loved one. Maybe it's a sin pattern in your life that you just can't get a hold of. Or maybe it's not like that. Maybe you're worrying about other things. Maybe you're worrying about the persecution of the church and you're wondering how we're going to survive. Or maybe you're just, maybe you are just mourning the sin sick death of this world. Maybe you have friends, maybe you have family who have just given in to it. Can I tell you today, just like that blind man, God has time for you. And there is a peace in Jesus that we cannot have, that we cannot know, until we take our cares and lay them on his shoulders. He will take them off of us. Amen. In a moment, we're going to pray. And I'm going to be standing up here. And if you need to pray, if you need to seek that God, then you're free to do so. I'll be here to pray with you. Lord, we thank you for gathering us here today. Lord, we thank you that you have time for us. We thank you that in the midst of all these worries, of all these cares, Lord, you are the same. The same that you have always been and that you have time for us. As we go from this place, Lord, I ask for your protection. And I ask that you will just ease the hearts and minds of this congregation, Lord, as we go from this place. Guide us and direct us. Draw us closer to you, ever closer, Lord. Amen.